play ball. I would like to reconvene the meeting and call this meeting to order for the City Council meeting of September 18th, 2018. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Councilmember Boyson? Here. Councilmember Cordero? Here. Councilmember Moats? Here. Councilmember Waterfield? Here. And Madam Mayor Patino? Here. City Attorney, Mr. Trujillo, could you please give the closed session report? Thank you, Madam Mayor. There is no reportable action for both items on the closed session agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Our first order of business is a proclamation, and Councilmember Waterfield will be making the presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is very exciting, and this is uh, really great to announce this proclamation for Allen Hancock College. Whereas Allen Hancock College has launched an innovative new program called the Hancock Promise, designed to change the odds for local Santa Maria students entering college by providing assistance for a student's first year at the college. And whereas this program is already having an impact within the community, resulting in 1,069 students from Santa Maria area schools attending Allen Hancock College, as first-year students beginning in fall 2018. And whereas these students will join many alumni who have launched successful careers and become valuable community leaders and embody the college's slogan of start here, go anywhere. Whereas Allen Hancock College's innovative approach to making college both affordable and accessible is now beginning in the fifth grade with a program called Bulldog Bound. And whereas it is in its first year of implementation, Bulldog Bound has already provided on campus experimental learning activities to more than 2,100 fifth and sixth graders within the district, with many more slated to attend this next year. And whereas the Hancock Promise program truly illustrates the college's commitment to assist students pursuing academic, transfer, career, and technical education programs. Now therefore, Alice M. Patino, Mayor of the City of Santa Maria, hereby proclaim September 18, 2018 as the Hancock Promise Day in the City of Santa Maria. And we extend our gratitude to local donors, business, and education leaders and organizations who have supported this program. Go Bulldogs! <laughs> And here to accept our doctors Kevin Walthers and Lee Volk Cox. Dr. Walters, I wish everyone could have heard the presentation. I heard at noon, but we don't have time. You don't, you don't, I'll give you more than four, three minutes, but we don't have time for the presentation. But it was a great presentation of what's going on at Hancock. Well, thank you. We're, we're, uh, we're just ecstatic about what's going on, and, and, and it's, it's a great time to be at Hancock. This is uh, truly going to be a historic time when we look back at it. Um, we're, we're thrilled by the support that we get from, from the city. Uh, from, from its elected officials and from its staff. Uh, um, you know, we, we count not just as colleagues, but as good friends, the, the city of Santa Maria and its people. And, and we're, we're really fortunate. And, and, and we're fortunate to have a strong community. You saw our, our board president here, Judy Markline is here. Uh, Crystal Perez is here from Robble Bank. Robble Bank gave us a million dollars to help pay for this. Uh, we are, um, we're excited and, and, and I'll, I'll, I just want to get to the point of what, how we got to this. And I actually was in Guadalupe one night talking to some parents and trying to explain to them how financial aid works through an interpreter. 
and it wasn't working. A bunch of parents of sixth graders. And I finally just said, you know, if you get your kids out of Rigetti, it's free. Just come to Hancock and we'll pay for it. And uh, as we walked out, my board president, Larry Lair, said, how are you going to do that? And I was like, I don't know. I've got five years to figure it out. So, um, but uh, but when, when I said to those parents, it's free, they understood. And, and you could see the look on their face because they're, you know, our, our, my, my kid, we're having a conversation about him, where he's going to go to college after Hancock. Uh, other families are talking about if you go to college. Uh, too many parents in our communities don't think that's even a conversation they can have. And this Promise program that's supported by the community and supported by, uh, by, by our local businesses is going to change that dynamic. And when we talk about changing the odds, um, nothing changes the odds for a community more than education. So we're honored by the proclamation and, and we're grateful to have, uh, have the council and the mayor and, and the staff as our friends. So thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have another proclamation, and Councilmember Cordero will be making the presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. This is a proclamation for Active Aging Week. Whereas Active Aging Week is celebrated nationwide for all to appreciate the myriad of benefits of adopting a healthier lifestyle, and whereas the City of Santa Maria observes Active Aging Week to inspire wellness through activities and exercise in a safe, friendly, and fun atmosphere, and whereas it is recognized that social well-being and community en enrichment benefits the city's active aging population, and whereas the city of Santa Maria has committed to providing quality service to the seniors, including leisure services, exercise classes, health screening, and fitness testing, and whereas active adults who are physically and socially healthy contribute to the city as volunteers, mentors, and role models. And whereas for the past seven years, the city of Santa Maria has acknowledged Active Aging Week and continues to uh, its efforts to recognize that healthier decisions affect quality of life. Now, therefore, Alice Patino, Mayor for the city of Santa Maria, hereby proclaims September 22nd, 2018 through September 29th, 2018 as Active Aging Week in the city of Santa Maria and to support the well-being of our senior population and the future generations and encouraging community members to remain active. And the mayor signed this on the 18th day of September, 2018. And here to receive it is Crystal Lawrence. I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Active Aging Committee. We are getting ready for a wonderful Active Aging Week. We are kicking off the week with um, a dance at the Elwin Muscle Center. Um, it's going to be a great week. We are trying to inspire wellness through activities, whether it be social activities or physical activities, or just coming out and chit-chatting while they watch other activities to get involved in the community. Um, the goal is to get our seniors who are at home active, involved, and maybe engaged in something, and maybe foster a, an activity or something that they used to love, and now they can enjoy it again. So I'd like to thank you again, and our sponsors that we've had, um, Oasis Senior Center, the Santa Maria Valley Senior Club, the Community Foundation of San Luis Obispo, the Alzheimer's Association, Marion Medical Center, <coughs> Rite Aid, Villa Maria, Central Coast Home Health and Hospice, and Santa Maria Terrace. Again, thank you so much. And thank you very much. <laughs> the next item on the agenda will be the public comment period. Madam Clerk, would you please read the criteria for the public comment portion of the agenda? This time is reserved to accept comments from the public on consent agenda items or matters not otherwise scheduled on the printed agenda. Unless otherwise directed by the mayor, speakers will have three minutes to comment. Direction to staff may be given. However, state law does not allow action to be taken on the city council by the city council on matters not on the printed agenda. Once the public comment period commences, no other speakers will be allowed to submit a request to speak form. 
Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers this evening? And we have three requests to speak. Thank you. So no further requests to speak for us will be accepted at this time. And you can set the timer for three minutes. Sarah McDonald, followed by Felipe, followed by Cheryl Austin. Good evening. Good I evening. just wanted to give you my report that I'm completely healed from my fall, and I'm here to give you my walking report. We need to consider having completed sidewalks on Stoll Road. I know this sounds crazy, but there's an area across from the cemetery that's not complete, and it, it's basically uh, has shrubbery. If we can, can work on getting our sidewalks where there is straight shots so people don't have to walk through neighborhoods so that they can get to places where you're going, because I like to walk to my uh, wellness classes over at uh, Marion, and uh, I take the Cemetery Ridge. Now, the Cemetery Ridge is this little narrow uh, walking space that's where the wall is, and it is very narrow. And I, if you're going at a certain, if you're going at a certain time, and you're going, and you're going east, you're going with the traffic. You can't tell if there's any uh, uh, trouble there. There, the traffic is. You can't tell the traffic behind you. But if you have the sidewalks on the other side where you could walk that would be continuous, then it'd be more safe. And also, across the area where, you know, Weatherbees is going to close. Well, that whole area where the, off of Enos, that needs to have a sidewalk, that needs to have a crosswalk kind of thing. Because I see a lot of people trying to dodge the cars and they're having to wait a long time to cross when it's safe, but we, we need to educate our, our pedestrians and, and also the drivers because they're not watching for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Felipe, followed by Cheryl Asan. <clears throat> My name is Felipe. I'm coming from the Northwest neighbors. One more time, because I come a long time ago, talk to you about the HA, HSA houses. We have a, one house like that next to me. And the reason I'm here is because I'm not exactly, uh, I'm not happy with that because it's, it's really hard to live there, okay? Number one, the, the garage they convert a living room and it's facing to my sliding door house. They come up from there and sometimes they be over there. I don't think it's right. I have a lot of grandkids. I have my wife there. And you guys, the first time we're talking about this, you promised to stop the program for 10 months and now happened. The following two weeks, these people start to put back in people in there. Now they got more than 10, okay? They start, I think, with six or eight. Now it's more than 10 people in there. I don't think it's fair because build those houses, those houses are single houses. And every time I run over there or I walk over there, I'm looking for a sign that say, now it's commercial. I don't see no signs. If it does, that change now, I can put in a business and my neighbor too. I don't think that's fair because now, uh, uh, I like to know and I like to find out who is the owner, and I need a phone number to call in case of, emer in case of emergency. I talked to four, four different guys, four different <coughs> people, and everyone say, I'm the owner. But the real truth, I don't know who is the owner. Okay, I like to have all those things in my hands because in case of emergency, then we, contact, we can contact straight to them. So I think it's it for today, but I think too is enough because I, I, again, I've been talking to you guys and, and you guys don't do nothing for us. We need to see something from the city to put hands in this 
kind of a problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felipe. Can you give the address of the house to um, our city manager here? And uh, uh, Mr. Silwell, can you have our police check on that and then contact the owner of the house and tell them what the problems are, please? Thank you. It's a 1947, the address. That's Via Caro? Via Caro, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Cheryl Asan. Hi. My Good name evening. is Cheryl, and as most of you know. Um, I'm here, first of all, to say thank you for trying to have the meetings. But they're not helping. It was a great idea to do those meetings, but we're getting conflicting answers to our questions. Yes, they can't. No, they can't drink. Yes, they can. You can only have 10 people in size of Mr. Moat's house. Well, the house that on Via Caro is a lot smaller than Mr. Moat's. Than Dr. Moats, I should say, sorry. But, you know, so we're, we're just getting conflicted answers to the questions we're asking. And it's not doing. And then you guys aren't having a meeting for two months. You're going into the holidays. How many people are going to want to go to a meeting in the holidays? It has brought a lot of attention because a lot of people have stopped me and said, we didn't know about this. And they're starting to notice more and more houses. And they're not happy either. We have one, a friend of mine uh, off of Kaladi, right by the Highway Patrol, right behind the hi Highway Patrol. There's three buses sitting back there. She goes, I never even realized it. So, you know, the, the one thing about the meetings is the city's finding out, and a lot of them don't like it. You know, I know you guys are sort of with your hands tied because of the state and the federal, but, you know, you guys are our representatives. You guys need to go higher up if you guys can't do anything. You know, there's something that, you know, we're the citizens, even, and we are the legal aliens. And we're doing everything right that we're supposed to. We follow the laws. And these guys, you know, the H2A comes in, oh, they promise everything. Oh, we're going to be good and stuff. And like Felipe said, they're peeing on right by his sliding glass door. He's got little girl granddaughters. Would you like that for your granddaughters to see that? And that was one of the first things we talked about in January when we brought this up to you guys. So, you know, we're just asking for what we deserve also. Thank you. You know, I, I usually don't like to respond, but part of this that we're putting together, Mrs. Ha Mrs. Hassan, is that we are also getting informed of what, what's going on and what the law is or isn't. And in order to form um, a, an ordinance, then we have to be educated. And Mr. Senko, I think, has been doing a great job of that in pulling people in. I know maybe some of your questions aren't being answered, but we're all getting we're all getting the information because we need to put an ordinance together that'll that'll be legal is what it amounts to and i understand that but that's what i'm saying is you know the city tells us one thing and mr cinco has been great answering everything we mm -hmm. have but then we went to this last meeting and all they really talked about was how to start an h2a how to get one going we we wanted to know how to control them and then they were telling us like i said Dr. Moats' house can only have 10 people. Well, we've got 10 people on a hundred, more than 10 people on a 1,100 square foot house. So that's what I'm saying. We're getting conflicted, you know, we don't know where to go. So we come to you guys for the answers. And I know you guys don't have it because you guys were shocked when we told you about it. So, you know, but I'm just saying, with the meetings, we have to, you know, you got to find out the right answers, not letting them just tuck tell us one thing and another. That's all I'm saying. We want to know what's going on. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yes, Dr. Motes. Yeah, the, the 3,200 square foot house for 10 people was a hypothetical house. I don't really have such I, a house. I, I, I figured that. <laughs> I'm just saying when you said that and we heard, oh, you can only have 10 people, we're going, wait a minute. 
we've got 1,100 square foot over here. And we were told that, can only, that it can be 10 people, which there is more now. They've brought more and more in, just like we were, we're worried about. And, and okay. uh, Mr. Silwell is going to be checking on that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Madam Clerk, um, this concludes the public comment portion of the agenda. Before we move on, Mr. Stilwell, did you want to make any comments? Sure, just briefly, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. So the section of the Stoll Road that Sarah McDonald, Ms. McDonald mentioned is one that Councilmember Waterfield has asked us to look into some time ago. The challenge on that spot is the narrow right-of-way and we also have uh, pg e poles really right in the middle of the sidewalk. So it really constrains the ability for us to repair the sidewalk. We are in active conversations with pg e for them to relocate the poles, their major service lines. So it's a large project to undertake. It's not just something we can do unilaterally, but we recognize the need for that better pedestrian egress through that section of Stoll Road by the cemetery. Thank you. Was, wasn't that one of the areas that uh, when we analyzed the uh, asking PG&E to underground certain areas, that was one of our top priorities, right? Yeah. And, and I think they have funding for that. Is that correct? Right. The uh, PG&E is called Rural 28 Funding, and cr currently we're working with PG&E on, on a project that's downtown here. When that project is complete, we'll be coming back to you for looking at the next priority project you want to do. We've also hired a, an engineer to start looking at Stoll Road and what it would take to um, put the sidewalks out there. It would take some right-of-way takes because the right-of-way is so narrow and the bushes uh, transcend, but we are starting the plans and being proactive on that also. And Thank you know, you. not not to be so condescending to PG&E, but that project you're talking on Main Street has. I was involved when I was a planning commissioner on that. So it's well, the one just I'm talking about now is right downtown, right here. Yeah. Okay. And then the one on Main Street and Stoll or Bosser. That's correct, and yeah. that work's been done. Right. So we're just trying to make that uh, extra turning lane for. That's for that. correct. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on to the consent calendar, Madam Clerk, could you please read item number three? Routine items are presented for City Council approval without discussion as a single agenda item in order to expedite the meeting. The consent calendar is approved by roll call vote with one motion, and these items are discussed only on request of Council members. Okay. And Mr. Boyson. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, uh, out of an abundance of caution, I would like to pull um, item 3D and... Okay. Uh, uh, move it to the regular agenda. That'll be fine. Just to make sure that um, we Absolutely. have dotted okay. all our I's and crossed all our T's. And Madam Mayor, I'm going to have to abstain from 3E. 3E? Okay. Anything down here? 3D and 3E. Okay. So then based on that, Madam Mayor, I would uh, request a, or I would uh, move for approval of the consent calendar with the exception of items 3D and 3E. Second. Okay, okay it's been moved in the second uh, to, uh, to approve the consent calendar with the exception of 3D and 3E. Um, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Boyson? Aye. Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Councilmember Moats? Aye. And Mayor Patino? Aye. And then, Madam Mayor, I would move for the uh, approval of uh, item 3E. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second to approve item 3E. Second. It's been second already. So, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Councilmember Boyson? Aye. Councilmember Moats? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. And Mayor Patino? Aye. Okay, the next order of business is appointments. Madam Clerk, could you pre please read the title and present the staff report? Madam Mayor, I think we still need to do the 3E, the warrants. 3D. No, we, we move 3D to the... To the regular... To the regular... Agenda. To the regular agenda. Okay. And we I, approve I mean, I 3E. Guess we could take that. What? Before the appointments, or do you want to... Well, I, I would like to move... I'd like to take it close to the block grants okay. and and the home for good collaborative somewhere in there so uh -huh. that, because it, it's all about the same thing good okay, okay. Got it. so the next order of business is the appointments 
The City Council will consider making one appointment to the Block Grants Advisory Committee. Uh, Mayor Patino and Council members, the request before you tonight is to make one appointment to the Block Grants Advisory Committee for a term ending in July 2021. The committee currently has one <coughs> vacancy and two applications were received from Eric Marksud and Rebecca Patterson. The appointment is to be made by Mayor Patino with ratification by the City Council. Okay, and I would like to nominate Rebecca Patterson. Do I have a second? Okay, so it has been moved in second to recommend a, a Rebe Rebecca Patterson. Um, can I have a roll call? Mayor Patino. Aye. Councilmember Waterfield. Aye. Councilmember Motes. Aye. Councilmember Cordero. Aye. And Councilmember Boyson. Aye. Thank you. So under presentations, the order of um, proceedings for this item, Madam Clerk. The City Council will receive a presentation by Eddie Taylor, CEO of the Home for Good Collaborative, formerly the Central Coast Collaborative on Homelessness. And Mr. Stowell, would you like to do the introductions? Sure. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. Just as by way of introduction, this is the periodic uh, presentation the City Council receives on the status of homelessness and our efforts to address homelessness in the City of Santa Maria. This is a president presentation from Home for Good with Eddie Taylor making the presentation. This was previously came to the council as the Central Coast Collaborative on Homelessness. And so Eddie can present this. Does this come with instructions? Good evening, everybody. Mayor, council, thank you for having us back. Um, I want to start tonight by telling you we're, we're going to talk about three, three or four different things. Um, the coordinated entry system, which is part of Home for Good, uh, the Funders Collaborative, the um, uh, Social Impact Fund, and the Business Leaders Task Force. Uh, I want to introduce a couple of folks who have joined the team. Um, I shouldn't say joined because Dorothy, y'all know Dorothy already, right? Dorothy Mogavero, right? So Dorothy has moved over from operations over to Home for Good to um, lead the efforts in North County for us. And um, Carmen, Carmen Sampson, has been doing some incredible work leading the team. Uh, can I tell a story about her real quick? They brought me <coughs> pictures of the work that they're doing. It's really exciting stuff. They were actually working with uh, San Maria Police Department last week. I was so excited to hear that. And then they showed me pictures. They were out riding on four-wheelers in the riverbed. So... They have fun while they work, and they're doing some important stuff. Before we get into Dorothy's presentation about what's happening here in Santa Maria, I want to give you an overview, and I want to introduce Kimberly Albers, who's with us tonight from the County Office of Housing Community Development. If you have questions, or when you have questions about the emergency declaration, she can answer those questions for us. We do ask you for your support for that effort, because it's going to have a profound impact on the work that we get to do. Um, the funding from the transitional housing grant and also the, the city funding in nine months. So we came to you in January. We took this thing over C3H on January 23rd. In nine months, working with the teams throughout the county to develop the coordinated entry system, there are now 1,020 s separate entries in the database system. Eight, uh, 980 of those are individuals, 120 some are families. About 10% of those individuals are veterans. We know all about them. We know where they are. We know what the needs are. And now we can make data-driven decisions. Tomorrow morning at the third uh, funders collaborative that we'll hold, we'll take a deep dive into funding. So if you're going to be there tomorrow, you'll hear a lot about how the funding that's coming to the county through the state and the federal government can be invested for us to really elevate our work. But I'm really tickled that in less than nine months, really. I mean, we started January 23rd. We had to ramp up. That took a month or so. And in that period of time, we've got more than 1,000 entries in this database that will help us make decisions on how we best help people. The partners include, there are five regional um, entry points, two of them with partnerships with Good Sam in Lompoc and uh, Santa Maria, so that we've got an extensive partnership throughout the county. We also have a couple of models that we've put in place. You're aware of the one of them here in Santa Maria where we housed five of the highest utilizers of law enforcement and hospital services. Uh, four of those folks are still housed. If I, 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 hope, I hope I'm okay saying this. One of them's going to school 
Yes? One of them's enrolled in school, right? Off the street, going to school, getting a job is in her future. Um, and it's a model that's working. We're replicating that in Carpentria, we're replicating that in Lompoc, and pretty soon we'll be able to pull another one together here in Santa Maria. The impact it has on those lives is for generations, and that's what we like to do at the United Way. So Dorothy's going to give you some more details about the impact right here in Santa Maria. Um, and then if there are any questions, we'll be around to ask. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we really have uh, been looking at Santa Maria and North County being a, a representative of what we can accomplish. And I think that we're really making an effort in that direction. We've increased our staff by using AmeriCorps members, which really creates this great buddy system for those who have been doing outreach along with those who are coming into the field and really wanting to make a difference with the community. So, first of all, thank you. But I thought we'd take a look at, let's see if we do this right. Um, it's not very big, at least not from this point, vantage point, but um, I'm going to start off with goals. So basically, you know, what is it that we're trying to accomplish here? So it's just going to be a, a quick snapshot. We want to establish our reg regional entry points, which we have. We have one here, we have one in Lompoc, and of course they cover the rest of North County. We establish coordinated outreach teams. We reach, out, we reach all homeless for assessment. We are going out. We're not just waiting for them to come to our, our sites, our, our uh, coordinated entry sites, but we're also going out into the community, looking for them, addressing them, uh, you know, really kind of speaking to them and bringing them along to want to make those changes. We want to know everyone's name. We're building those relationships. Sometimes it does take some time. Perform assessments to know what their needs and their wants are. Refer to rapid rehousing. Refer to permanent supportive housing. Identify supportive services. There's so many different ways in which we need to come alongside of them to help them to continue to reach self-sufficiency and provide case management to retain supportive housing. This is just a snapshot of some of our most important areas, but in doing so, we bring them along to, um, to get into housing and walk along with them. We don't want to do what we've done in the past so often. We do a great job of giving them support services and then they're on their own. And we need to change that and that's part of this whole program. Now we look at some of our successes for North County. Over 1,300 individuals and families assessed, 95 are veterans. Uh, we have over 50% recommended for permanent supportive housing. We have over 2,800 referrals that we have provided. Referrals can be from one end to the other. It could be education, it could be income, it could be primary care, it could be behavioral wellness, and on and on. 90% have uh, received or are receiving case management and have their um, primary care has already been established. Super important, find out what those needs are and get them back to health. 12 have entered detox recovery programs, mostly with our, our partner, uh, the Good Samaritan Shelter, and we have three waiting for a bed that's already been promised. We have more than 25 partners, and when I say 25, 25, that's probably being very conservative. We have more and more, for instance, Hancock College, Loris College, and so forth, looking at education possibilities. So now let's take a look at some totals. Totals, we love numbers. That always makes a difference. So these totals represent about six, the last six months to give us just a snapshot of some of the important areas. Right there in the middle, 27 have been placed in housing out of this area in Santa Maria. 14 currently have housing vouchers that we're personally work, walking along with them to try and find the housing for them. Up in the left corner, 282 health interventions. That's behavioral wellness. That's uh, surgeries that are needed. Um, that's primary care and so forth. That's just really giving them, them the attention they need in the health area. 3,450 personal items provided. And when we say personal items, it can be anywhere from food, water, backpacks, a sleeping bag. It could be a first aid kit. Um, it could be lots of different things in which they need personally while we're trying to help them get them off the streets. 
We've got 12 into, into detox care, and we have 62 that we've given transportation assistance. When we say transportation, often it is bus passes, bus tokens, those type of things. Could be gas cards uh, in which they can now get to their appointments, um, whether it's medical, whether it's work even. We have quite a few out there that are actually working or going to school while they're living on the streets. Along with this, there's always challenges. Um, we find these challenges to be good in the sense that we need to know where is it that we need to do better? Where is it that we're not meeting the needs of who's out there? And is it something we can improve on or is it a collective measure? With all of us out there trying to make a difference and trying to change the lives of these homeless, improve the rapport with our businesses and our community, we're looking at some of these are the things that we're seeing for now. Insufficient housing opportunities. Section 8 and VASH vouchers issued, but they may expire due to the lack of local housing. Insufficient job opportunities. We really want to look at working on that, making contact with our businesses, having them buy in with uh, maybe taking a chance on somebody who's been out there and homeless, and they really want to work, and so giving um, them the opportunity to start over again. Insufficient funds available for housing deposits. That's a big one. We've got all the vouchers out there, of course, lack of housing, but once they find something, often we can't find enough of the funding to balance, for the balance of the deposits and things like that, so that's an issue. Um, a safe holding site for personal possessions. That seems to be a, a big one because so many of our homeless have a lot of personal possessions they're dragging along with them in a basket, in a car, on a bike, and so forth. We make these appointments with them for primary care, for w housing, for whatever it may be, and they don't go to them. Why? Because they're afraid to leave their possessions behind, to leave them with somebody else because they get stolen or lost or whatever the circumstance may be, and there's a fear to lose what little they do have. So that's an issue. And building trust. Many of our homeless individuals and families, they hesitate to accept help because they've been made promises in the past or they've received something but then all of a sudden there's nobody there anymore and they fall back into homelessness. So that's a big change for our program to walk with them. Could be a month, could be a year, could be forever depending on their circumstances and their needs and we're really looking at filling that. This is just a small chart, don't expect you to read through all of them, but just some of our partners and it's growing quickly. Um, with our partners comes their ability to use their resources, to use their staffing, to jointly look for funding, uh, grants and so forth, and to uh, helpfully um, combine our efforts instead of working independently like we have so often in the past. These, are, these partnerships are amazing and we're connecting all over the county. It's just not here, but we want to start it. We want to show what can be accomplished and use that whole uh, you know, action plan for the rest of our county. So um, that's my little presentation. Thank you so much. And um, if you have any questions for any of any, us. Any questions? I have one. Ms. Waterfield. Um, Dorothy, what is um, VASH housing? VASH is for veterans. It is their, their Section 8 type of voucher. Okay. And so, yes. And so there's an expiration on their voucher that if they can't find housing within that specific time, then they have to go and get it renewed? Correct. It's four months, and they can ask for an extension, but of course there's guidelines for under what circumstances that they'll be allowed an extension of the use of that voucher. So it goes for two months, and then a month extension, and then another month extension, and if they don't find a house by the four months, they lose their voucher. And then they can't be put back on the list unless the list opens up again. For the VASH, it's a little different. They are making exceptions, they can reapply, but for the regular Section 8, they do lose their certificate. And it's really hard. So it, when they do get, when they do find a VASH house, how long do they stay in that house? As long as the landlord allows. Can you, okay. when you speak, can you speak into the mic? Because it's yeah. all being recorded. As Thank you. As long as the landlord allows. Okay. So then when it expires, they have to get in back of the line then and It start. only expires if they don't find housing. As long as they stay in the income um, brackets, they still qualify. So once, if they, they usually don't drop off of it, but sometimes like they'll get jobs or so forth and approve there and then they become a, above the income. 
they won't have their voucher any longer. But that doesn't happen like overnight. It takes years. So do you know how many veterans that, that you know of in your system that has lost their certification for that this VASH housing? In this position, I don't. Okay. In my previous position, I've had lots of um, clients lose their vouchers. Yeah, okay. And then I'm curious about the 12 that are that have entered detox. Are they still in detox or have they left and do they, are they completely uh, helped where they don't go back to their previous behavior? That's a big effort. Um, when they go to detox, it depends on what they are needing to be detoxed from. It could be a week, it could be two weeks, but what we try to do along with Good Samaritan Shelter in particular is what we try to do is once their time is up in the detox, they now go either into the shelter or some other recovery home or something of that. So we're actively looking where to place them so they don't go back on the street mm -hmm. and go back to whatever it was that they were using. So there's a really huge <laughs> effort to find them some type of housing to continue uh, that so is this a county program that you put them in for the detox that has beds and... No, it's Good Samaritan Shelter. It's okay. a 7-14 day program. So, example, I have one client that we put in detox for seven days and then we made arrangements with case managers at Good Samaritan to put her into the shelter afterwards and then we put her into their outpatient program and then we case manage her once a week and then she has case management at the shelter and with the program. We have a small amount of funding okay. that is used for that for that to pay for detox, but often what we're doing is we're going to um, private funding to see who out there, whether it's um, businesses, uh, ch local churches, and so forth, that will pay for the cost of the detox. What's the cost of that? Two hundred and ten dollars a week. Okay. If they're local, well, since they're it's local, yes, yeah. it's two ten. Okay. okay. Dr. Motz. You had a question about detox. Um, is there medical supervision for people undergoing detox? This isn't, um, their shelter is not a medical detox. Pardon? Their shelter detox is not a medical detox. Oh, and the difference is? You would have to ask Kirsten. Okay. <laughs> so, I assume you do some follow-up on the people that have been through the detox program. I do. I follow them um, What's closely. What's the success rate in them not going back to their drugs of dependency? Um, it's like a 50-50 shot, honestly. Um, I have one that it took a month for him to go back and use, but he wouldn't follow through with case management as much as we tried. And we have another one who's successfully going, and it's because I constantly look for her and work with her so it's just up to them if they really want it and how bad they want it the case management is crucial to continue to walk with them and uh and work with them guide them okay and one final question you develop a personal relationship with these people you know who they are and uh, <coughs> i was just wondering uh, in the, uh, the HEAP uh, information we got, the Homeless and Emergency Aid Program, it said that there are 85 unsheltered homeless people living in the city of Santa Maria. Of those 85 people, how many want to become sheltered or how many choose to be unsheltered by choice? I don't think any of them choose to be unsheltered by choice. I think it's their circumstances that lead them to homelessness, but I can tell you that I probably know 65 of those clients by name. And I know them when I walk the streets or even when I'm on my days off, they all approach me for services. So then if you ask them if they'd like to attend a shelter, they would say yes, and then we could remove these 85 people who are unsheltered? Most of them would want to go to a shelters. The only problem is they have pets, and that's what keeps them from going to shelters. And that's a big thing that I see a problem with, is just that they can't take their animals. And they've had their animals with them for so long that they're partners in their homelessness, and that's the issue. But I believe if we had the proper shelters that we could house all of them out of homelessness. And could we come up with a program that will allow them to take their pets with them? I would hope we could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then our shelters don't have a, a placement for the animals, so that is something that would be, it would be helpful. Um, because often that animal is the only, you know, thing they have that they feel so attached to. 
Um, also, sometimes they are dogs for um, comfort. Mm -hmm. So they actually have a doctor's, uh, you know, basically saying that they need that, that dog for the emotional aspect of survival. Um, but I would like to add to that is that some of these um, homeless that we start to talk to, they're very lost in the sense that they've been out there for a while and they really start to feel like there is no hope. And sometimes it takes us walking with them weeks, sometimes months, for them to actually take a look at us and say, you know what, you really do want to make a difference for me. You really do want to help me. And therefore, they start to open up. But sometimes it, it takes some time of building that relationship and being out there with them so that they know that uh, life can change. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, both of you kind of touched on this, and I, I, I know the answer to this, but I think it's important that it, it, it gets emphasized a little bit. <clears throat> we talk about housing the homeless. And I think some of us mistakenly think that housing the homeless, you get them into the house, and by golly, we've achieved something and we're, we're done with them. Uh, in fact, that's not true. We, there's considerable follow-up and you follow them through. Even though they're housed, you follow through with them and you continue to advocate for them. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that is correct, and that is one of the beautiful changes about Home for Good and about the program, about uh, the continuum of care and the way it's structured, is they don't want us just providing support services and then walking away thinking they can do it on their own. It sometimes, like we said, it takes months, it takes years. Some of these folks probably need some case management or care for the rest of their lives. And that's the change in this program, which is going to take staffing because, um, you know, we've got a small amount of staff out there now. We've got a lot of agencies attempting to come together and do the same thing, but it's really important that we um, continue to walk with them as they need. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Boyce, and you didn't have any questions. <laughs> you know all the answers on this one. Um, I'd like to ask you, who does manage the Section 8 housing? Is that the Housing Authority? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. And can you run down, I guess, give me a Cliff Notes version of, of how Section 8 actually works? So after they receive their vouchers, they get the four months period. How do they get a voucher? Um, they, there was an open period where they took applications online. So it was a few months ago. And then they do a random pick by their points that they get. They get 25 points for being a, um, what is it called, resident. And then they get five points for working, like, I think they get five points for being a veteran. And um, there's a preference point for being homeless. You get, I think, two points for being homeless. So they um, break it down into their points and then they pull their numbers. They go for a briefing and then they get their certificate, which means you go look for a place and, um, you turn in the application. It, some landlords won't work with housing, so sometimes, like I've been advocating for my clients to convince the um, landlords to work with housing because it they do pay seventy percent of the rent, and then the recipient of the voucher pays thirty percent of their income. So if they're making five hundred and sixty-five dollars a month, their rent's going to be like one seventy-eight. And it just depends if there's utilities included or not. If all the utilities are included, the rent's a little higher. If the utilities are not included, they get um, some leeway in their pay, so it goes down a little bit so they have the money so that it doesn't become over 30% of their income going towards rent and utilities. Okay, you said they get the, um, they can go on, uh, online to get the voucher? It's an online application through um, the Housing Authority of Santa Barbara County. Okay, so, but these people would have to go someplace to use a computer. So when the, um, it, the list opened, Good Samaritan worked with the clients, we okay. worked with clients, there was paper applications, uh -huh. however it was easier be, to go online and do it, so there was this big rush of month, the month that was open, and we helped as many people apply for Section 8 as possible during that time. We help them get their documents prepared to turn in because they had to prove their ID, their income, if they have bank accounts, their social security cards, um, birth certificates for everybody in the house. So it's getting them document ready to turn in all the paperwork to the housing. It's not a very easy process, but it was doable. So, and you may know this, you may not. 
So does the housing authority work with like the real estate association and do they go out and try to find? No, they don't go out and try to ha help housing. find housing. It's okay. all on your own. So you're left to do it on your own. Wow. It, it, it's a hard process and a lot of certificates. I'll jump in for a okay. Second. Those are great questions, Mayor. Um, so nine months in, right? And we're building a business model to address this. The Housing Authority does a great job. Uh, and I'll tell you how good it is because I, I just happened to pull the data up. <laughs> so they released uh, 400 vouchers on the last release. As of yesterday, 211 of those have um, actually been leased up. And 77 of those were actually previously homeless individuals. So 36% of the vouchers that have been used in this round have been used by previously homeless individuals. So the aspect that you're talking about, though, Mayor Patino, is, is what we call scattered site opportunities. It's working with landlords. So we have a group called the Landlord Liaison. <laughs> the Partners for Housing service solutions thank you everybody likes to change their name it's a new acronym yeah. for me to remember so the partners in housing solutions are actually very active in developing those landlord relationships but what we recognized at home for good is that there's an opportunity for us to really participate in that arena uh, and that's exactly what happened for us in Lompoc yesterday a scattered site leasing opportunity so that we can work with landlords to work with the folks that the teams are actually out there working with and identify who can be housed and how they'll fit. Right? So it's not a fit for everybody. But we need a lot more landlords. Um, if you read uh, Chief Walsh's uh, message this morning in, in the newspaper, he's asking people in Lompo, you know, open up your house because we can use Section 8 vouchers for room rentals. That's a possibility that's never been explored. And then I want to address one other question that you had about um, collect collecting the data in the partnership with the city on the transitional housing grant. One of the things that we recognized we needed was technology. So a lot of our folks actually walk around with tablets. So if there's an opportunity to work with somebody in the riverbed, we've got tablets that we can connect, get the data into the system so that we can begin working with them at a deeper level. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Madam Boyce? Mayor, just yeah. add on to this, and correct me if I'm wrong, Eddie, but as I understand it, even with the 400 new housing vouchers that were uh, uh, released, uh, we still have over 4,000 individuals on the waiting list. Yes. In, uh, I knew there was a huge, yes. uh, huge so waiting list, but I didn't know that was. In the county of Santa Barbara. <coughs> oh, in the so, county of Santa Barbara. So it's, okay. you know, yeah. I, I don't want to say it was merely a drop in the bucket. It was great to have those 400 vouchers, yeah. but, but we still have a long road to go before we make a dent in housing the homeless. Thank you. Did you have a question? Well, Dr. Motes. So we have a housing shortage, yet we also have this H2A program. And uh, an H-2A uh, house owner can get $500 per H-2A worker. And I assume that a lot of them would probably rather rent H-2A than Section 8. Have you been encountering any problems with this? Not specifically, no, sir. Mm -hmm. um, it, it probably is an issue because we're driven. But when we told, I'll give you the story of yesterday talking to the landlord, who could have used H-2A, right, but chose to help. Her preference is to help veterans. That's what she wanted to do. When we explain that, we may not have veterans that can actually match, but we do have chronic homeless individuals who we could place. They were fine with that. So it really is, a, a, again, negotiating um, with individual landlords to identify who's willing to work is willing to put themselves in that place. And then, again, individual homeowners with rooms um, that could rent a room for a Section 8 voucher, which is valued at $784, I think. Just the room. $784. If you wanted to rent a room in your, it's not a 3,100 square foot home, right? I've got that part. If I wanted to rent one of the spare rooms in my home because my kids are gone, $784 would be the voucher amount that we could be paid by the County Housing Authority That's good. for that room. Do you know of any plans to actually acquire land and build a new structure for a new homeless facility that, say, might have a provision for dogs? A provision for dogs? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, that's just a, that, pets, 
um, is a tough deal, right? Unless it's um, an emotion, an emotional support animal. Well, even disregarding the dog issue, uh, is is there any plan to yes. to actually build new space yes. to house the homeless. Yes. And what are, what's the plan? So the housing authority, as you know, is uh, breaking, already broke ground, or tomorrow? On depot, down the street, right? Mm. So, and that 80-some unit complex is 35 units set aside for mental health units, right? So that's going to be a big impact on our city for the chronically homeless with mental health issues. So there, some will be housed at that location. Beyond that, we have to utilize our efforts with our social impact fund to access opportunities to build um, new, opportun new housing opportunities. But I'll remind you of what I said when I first came in front of you a few months ago. We can't solve this problem if we don't build. You have to build. But when I say build, I don't just mean build new units because we're not going to be able to build enough units fast enough for us to solve the problem that we have in our community. We need to build new units. We need to build smaller houses. We need to build opportunities with landlords. We need to build opportunities with homeowners. We need to build better relationships. And I'm going to say it enough that I think someday I'm not going to be the only one who actually reads the document. We have to build in accordance with the 51 approved strategies to combat homelessness in our community. It's a document. It was developed by people who are a lot brighter than we are. Well, I won't put that. They're a lot brighter than me. Let me, let me reframe that for you. The 51 approved strategies, when you read through it, it's a business plan to approach homelessness. And the LA County, LA County organizations are the ones that put it together. It's a business plan. And so I encourage everybody to download it, read it, take a look at it. Right now, our COC identified um, the platform by which they want to follow um, their priorities. And that just came out last month at the general meeting of the C Continuum of Care. When you look at those priorities, they align perfectly with the 51 approved strategies to combat homelessness. So we can now dig into that document and see exactly how to build those initiatives around those very priorities. That's what we're doing in Home for Good. And part of it is building. Mr. Boyson. And just to piggyback onto that, I think also uh, in answer uh, to your question, uh, Councilman uh, Motes, is that you know we as a council have to set a priority too. In our last two uh, biannual strategy sessions, we have not placed an emphasis on homelessness as being uh, part of our um, uh, priorities for our funding capabilities. A lot of these situations can be solved, but it just takes money. Um, having a wet shelter in town, just some place that people can come, uh, perhaps uh, even having a, an area that you know they can keep their dogs in, things like that. Just having a safe place for people to come at night. Um, it can be done. It, 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 as Eddie says, it's the business model, but it has to be funded somewhere. And that funding, most of it would have to probably come from the city and come from our general fund. And, and that's up to us as city council uh, folks to, to set those priorities. So, I'm so off my if, you, if you would, if I could just close with this, because you all know I have a great imagination, right? So imagine this. You all have land. Somewhere in the city, there is land that is usable for some kind of a project that could be utilized for, let's call them ADUs, small homes. Um, it could be you know, uh, some of the projects that we have planned are micro units, 560 square foot units that will um, house one or two people um, identified from specific subpopulations. If you have the land and we have a social impact fund that has already raised the money that's needed to start a project, then we have solutions we can put in place. But it takes us working together and thinking a little bit differently than we ever have in the past. The county has land. The cities have land. And so one of the 51 strategies is identifying those opportunities and how we work together to get beyond all of the things that says we can't do it, just because we've never done it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Did you have any comments, Mr. St okay. Madam Clerk, are there any written communications or requests to speak on this item? We do have one request to speak. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, Ignacio Sanchez. <laughs> You forgot this. No, no, sorry. Oh, it's yours. <laughs> okay. And so, I feel we should do our best, you know? Uh, and I mean that, like, as Americans, to build up our communities just as our forefathers did. And they, they did well. They really did. And we must not forget where we came from either. The homeless is the public, too. I mean, no matter how you look at it, I mean, shit. We, we all had a place one time. Um, at least when we had a place to live, uh, this, this was, you know, we, we, weren't, we weren't bothered like we were. Uh, we didn't have to carry things. We, we had uh, electricity, water, gas, shower. We had all the leisures and blessings in this time uh, we live in. Um, the benefits, opportunities, resources, and the support and aid available to us is, is well, as I just said, electricity, water, gas, safety, and protection, and processed food, and, and, and just having a place to stay, you know? Uh, but that, ain't, that isn't available to uh, any of the public homeless is out, out here now because, well, quite frankly, I'm sorry to be uh, blunt about it, but your idea against, like, um, drugs and everything, I understand it. It's the country needs federal law, but if you don't change your discrimination idea uh, that you already made in your mind of a person, then they're going to be where uh, you already put out that uh, they're going to be. Like, if you look at this person and say, hey, they're no good, and, well, how are they ever going to get right in life? I in mean, telling in someone they're kicked out of school, or, or giving in someone a much harder task be, only because of a, a thought you have of them. And it, it, it can't work like that. Uh, it shouldn't, because then the people end up homeless and the people end up in, in a bad state. A, like, that mental health uh, problem that some of the homeless people have, I, it, <coughs> it has to come from something, right? And that's probably from what they had experience. And my brother's in uh, uh, Peyton right now, uh, and I'm sorry, but I never choose to be homeless. And, I never made any choices in life like, that led to in my homelessness, like my dad being deported, and like that that one hit when I was ten, and I had to pick up where he left off, or like um, um, because as my mom uh, had tried to stop uh, child prostitution next door, or uh, like the cops ups ended up targeting her. Uh, and so my family picked up more history with the uh, law enforcement and during my teenage years because I smoked weed. May I continue? No, thank you very much, Mr. Sanchez. Because I have more ideas like... Okay. Um, well, we'll be, we'll be here again in a couple of weeks. Honestly, thank, that, that, thank you. That's, that, that's... Thank you. Okay, at this point, I would like to bring back the Homeless Emergency you, you Aid don't Program. Care about the homeless, but I represent the people who do not come in here because they're scared of you. They, they, they don't think that they'll be heard and they're right. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sanchez. So do the, I need to the be next... escorted out of here? Because I'll do that myself, but honestly, I mean, I come in here and, like, you don't listen to me. You didn't even look at me. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. So the Homeless Emergency Aid Program Declaration of Shelter Crisis. And Any, so I'm bringing that back. That was 3D in the emergency. Um, the mail's really doing this right here. I, so would you like to in, uh, bring uh, that for us, Mr. Stillwell? Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council.
So the county is in a position to receive $9.4 million in grant money for homeless uh, sheltering. Okay. And uh, part of the condition for the county to be eligible to receive the $9.4 million, which would be used countywide, is to have a both a population base that uh, meets the threshold, and that would include the city of Santa Maria, and also uh, for the eight cities to um, accept it or designate that their city is in a shelter crisis. By designating you're in a that the city is in a shelter crisis, it allows the funding to be spent in the city more broadly, um, and the funding can be used for shelter emergency, for housing uh, assistance, and for homeless services. And so um, uh, Rosie Nadez from, or Rosie Rojo now, uh, <laughs> from Community Development is here to be able to explain uh, this grant opportunity. And so if by the City Council adopting a resolution to declare a shelter emergency, it puts the city and our um, nonprofits within the community eligible to receive this funding for homeless services. Thank you. So it's Mrs. what? Rojo. Rojo, okay. You're on. Okay. Yeah, Rosie Red, yes. <laughs> Rosie Red. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, City Manager Stillwell. Uh, pretty much summed it up, uh, but I will I will go into a little more detail. We also have uh, Kimberly Al Alders. Albers, thank you, uh, from the County of Santa Barbara. She's also here, and she knows heap inside and out. So if you have any additional questions okay. between the three of us, we'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes. Um, in regards to what Mr. Stilwell just said about the $9 million, how does that get divvied up? Is it in regards to how many homeless you have in each a community that has been tossed around as uh, using the point in time count from 2017 as a basis for how the money is distributed I don't think that the county has and, and the COC have uh, come up with one sure way of divvying it up I think they were waiting for the NOFA which was released a week and a half ago but maybe uh, Kimberly can add to that there will be a local NOFA process where the city themselves would be up, um, eligible to apply or uh, if they just declare the shelters crisis or the nonprofit providers that could serve here in Santa Maria so there'll be a local notice of funding availability uh, for almost the entire amount um, besides the administrative dollars and we anticipate that NOFA being released at the end of September um, with a due date at the end of October now, are you wait ex were you going to give a report of s I, I can if council would like or if you, you I, feel you have enough information we can proceed I, with questions I would like you to give a report so the public can hear what we're talking about sure please okay uh, okay. We come before you tonight to recommend that you adopt a resolution declaring a shelter crisis in the city of Santa Maria and approve the city's efforts to partner with the County of Santa Barbara in applying for the Homeless Emergency Aid Program, here on out referred to as HEAP. Some background information for you. HEAP is a $500 million block grant program designed to provide direct assistance to cities and counties to address the homeless crisis throughout California. An estimated allocation of $9.3 in HEAP funding is potentially available for eligible homeless assistance within the jurisdiction served by the County of Santa Barbara's Continuum of Care, also known as the COC. That's made up of all eight cities in Santa Barbara County. Because the funding is primarily based on population size, the City of Santa Maria, or any city in the county for that matter, cannot apply for the funding on its own. However, the County of Santa Barbara, through its COC, can apply and all eight cities in the county can partner up and participate in the program. In order for any city to be eligible for all of the program funds that the COC may receive under HEAP, the grant requires the, the governing body of each city and county within the local COC to declare a shelter crisis. Approval of this resolution will allow the City of Santa Maria to be eligible to apply for the HEAP funds the county may receive. There is no reference to matching fund requirements in the HEAP program guidelines. 
This concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, Mr. Wait, Mr. Boyson. Yeah. Well, I just following up on your previous question, Councilwoman Waterfield. And so, is there a specific formula or guidelines that cities are going to be given for the funding, or is this just going to be based on NOFA and up for scores and who needs it most is going to get the most? <laughs> I think that's a question again for the County of Santa Barbara who yeah. will be the managing entity. And again, my name is Kimberly Albers and I'm the Homeless Assistance Program Manager for the County of Santa Barbara. Um, so we don't have an actual scoring rubric done yet, um, but we do anticipate um, we have to have some local priorities set, which include acquisition of housing, operation, operating support for emergency housing interventions, as well as rental assistance and housing stabilization and location services. That includes things like homelessness prevention, rapid rehousing that you're used to. And so um, we do, we will give the panel, it will be a rank and review process similar to what you just described. Um, and then that would be uh, also put in with some panel instructions over the geography, um, making sure that anyone who declares a shelter crisis is represented in the funding and those with the larger point in time counts um, certainly are, uh, that's part of it. We're not actually giving points on that, but they will be given, the panel will be given some guidance on um, how that breaks out, North County, South County. Okay, thank you. Ms. Waterfield. My, my question, and I think you, you may have answered it, has to do with a pre, a homeless, preventing homelessness where we have been able to talk to mobile home park owners or mobile yeah mobile home park owners that their spouse has has died they they've taken away their social security their retirement and they're just barely making ends meet can this money also be used to prevent them from from going out on the streets because they are usually elderly people and we want to make sure that they're they're definitely kept in their homes I think one of the reasons I'm most excited about the HEAT program is because prevention dollars are on the table for the first time since 2012. Right. And so, um, so we do anticipate, besides cities or small allotments, um, that is an eligible use for the funds. And so we're really hoping um, that a nonprofit provider or potentially the city would apply for homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing dollars um, to absolutely be able to serve uh, those in your community that are at risk and that we don't want to wind up on the streets. And we're seeing that seniors are, uh, uh, with Absolutely. fixed incomes, with rising rents and H2A and all the things are being discussed tonight, um, that they are very much an at-risk population. And so really a blessing of HEAP is um, the prevention dollars being an eligible expense and something prioritized here from the local continuum of care. So your declaration tonight would allow whoever the applicant is to um, use rental assistance dollars here in the city of Santa Maria where you not, if you do not declare the shelter crisis, then actual rental assistance to dollars to, in a homelessness prevention program could not be spent within the city limits. And that's that's very important to, uh, yeah. to me, is because we do have senior citizens, we, oh, Dr. no Rose? matter where they live, uh, facing this. According to the figures we received on the HEAP report, Santa Maria, city of, has about 18% of the homeless in Santa Barbara County. Yet, do we only have 10% of the homeless that are unsheltered? It would seem that the unsheltered homeless would be more in line for emergency aid rather than those who are already sheltered. But that puts us in a disadvantageous position because it seems we don't have that many unsheltered relative to the total homeless. If we have $9.4 million and we just apportion it due to homeless, we should get $1.7 million. But if we apportion it due to unsheltered, it'll be like 900000 I know you already haven't decided what you're going to do, but I was just curious about this because it makes a big difference in how much money the city of Santa Maria will receive. Well, we definitely need applicants with qualified projects um, to apply for the money that will serve the city of Santa Maria or potentially the city to apply themselves. Um, but I have your numbers higher than that, <laughs> percentage-wise. Um, so I think we represented to the continuum of care that we thought the Santa Maria area was about 25% of the homeless population. We weren't looking at just the unsheltered count. 
Um, and then we're talking about sort of a North County, South County. If you look at several different rubrics, about 40% in North County mm -hmm. and 60% in South County, even those, those would just be guidelines. Well, the numbers we got, Santa Barbara County at total has 1,860 homeless, of which 338 live in Santa Maria, which represents 18%. I'm just using the numbers that we were given. Yeah. So those numbers are in error. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. So, um, so the, the geographic portion, actually if you added up all the ge geographic representation from the 2017 point in time count, and I apologize for getting in the weeds, but since you brought it up, I think it's important um, to clarify, it would only add up to about 1,489 people and the total count was 1,860. So the math I'm using um, when I'm talking about proportion is off of that 1,860 number rather than the 1,489, but you're correct that the best point in time count we have for Santa Maria in 2017 is based out of a sort of a universe of 1,489. Okay, thank you. Mr. Boyce. And I was just gonna add to that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Albers, but there, there was also some question. Um, we have significantly more um, homeless families in North County than they do in South County. They have more individuals, and uh, when we there was there was some conjecture in the point in time counts about how we counted those families, whether they were counted as one unit, um, at the same as an unsheltered individual would be counted. So uh, there, there was some discrepancies there, but I, I think Ms. Albers is right that, that the best guess that we have is that we would probably be entitled to that 25% number. Good. When you say unsheltered families, does that include or, children? I'm sorry, uh, not unsheltered, but homeless families. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, sheltered and unsheltered. We don't allow unsheltered children, do we? Well, we don't. I mean, we don't, but they're the, there. The, the, the shelters in town will make room for families. Now, that's not to say there aren't families that are living out in cars that we don't know about or that are refusing to come in the yeah. shelters, but yeah. Well, Mr. Boyce, maybe you'd know this. When is the point in time count going to be done again? So that, that's going to be in 2019, probably January of 2019. Try and get the coldest day of the year so that okay. everybody can get out there. <laughs> We just set a date, and so January 24th, 2019 will be the next point in time count. And actually, we're really hoping um, Council Member Motes to, to be very more comprehensive in making sure we get a better geographic representation of w people where people are, because there were some areas that were very much undercounted, like the San Inez Valley. So, I, I, and I can almost guarantee you that'll be the coldest night of the year. So you can put that in your... Wow. So, HUD requires the last 10 days of January. <laughs> we don't do that to you okay, on purpose. <laughs> so does HUD or does the County of Santa Barbara have a different definition of homelessness than the school districts do? That's correct. Okay. So, but those meeting the McKinney Vent No definition, um, which is what the school district use, um, if they do meet their imminent risk, like we were talking about, could be eligible for homelessness prevention dollars, but they would not meet the literal definition of homelessness if they're <coughs> doubled up or in a, a motel, a residential motel. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for being here tonight. I very much thank you for your consideration. Okay. Um, request to speak on this item? We have two requests to speak. Okay. Um, Araceli Cruz and Lisa Coker. Uh, we both represent Fighting Back Santa Maria Valley. We work with the homeless population in our school districts. I'm the homeless liaison for the high school district, and our Sally is one of two homeless liaisons for the Santa Maria Bonita School District. We primarily just want to, again, uh, ask for your um, support, support. <laughs> that you. we are declaring a homeless emergency here in Santa Maria, and most of the... Um, yeah emergency shelters and most of the uh, population that we work with are youth of color and they are at risk of becoming homeless and uh, as, as the McKinley Vento Act says, most of our students here are living in their car, either living in a 
um, doubled up housing, renting one room with a house full of um, other families. And uh, to be accurate, since we're talking about numbers, numbers. So we did the both school districts did a recent survey, and for Santa Maria Bonita School District, they have a number between 7,400 and 8,000. Um, homeless students in their school district and for Santa Maria Joint Union High School it's um, right around 4,000 <coughs> students homeless students in their district 4,000 in Santa Maria Joint Union High School District so that's according to the recent surveys they literally called every family um, in their in their school district and did a, a phone calls weeks and weeks of phone calls to ask each uh, family what their housing situation was whether it was in cars, in hotels, in the shelter, um, or double, triple, or quadrupled up. So that's where we got, the, the districts got those numbers. Can, can, can I just ask you, really? Yeah. I mean, there's yes. only, what, 9,000 students right. in the high school district, and you're right. telling us that... That's how, how that's how the housing crisis is right now. 4,000 of them? Yes. Yes, according to the McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness, homelessness. yes. And we do conduct home visits, so we're you guys are we're verifying. To come along and join us when we're doing these home visits, and we want to make sure that our children and our youth uh, get the opportunity to excel in Santa Maria and become leaders, future leaders. But how can we um, provide them with the resources when there is a lack of funding and resources, and they are our future. And without your support, then where will they be heading? We want to make sure that they that we do provide all the services such as transportation and we consistently provide transportation um, 7 15 a.m. until we pick them up after school and most of these children have no idea that they are homeless so it, it's norm it's a norm mm -hmm. so like I have a family right now well several families but one of the families that's coming to mind they live in their car they've lived in their car for over a year now uh, they shower at the showers, um, um, they shower at the Y, they shower at Abel Maldonado, they shower at the showers of care at the church here. No, I was, I was just telling her to give her more time because there was the two of you there. Okay. And so, um, so, and they don't, they don't even, they don't realize there's three children and a mom and they don't, they don't consider themselves homeless because they are sleeping in their car. They, and they've been there for over a year now, it's the norm for them. So a lot of times why the counts are wrong when, when the schools are, when they're registering their children for school is they don't, they don't realize that that's even a, 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 a box to check. If they're in a home, like a, we have a lots and lots and lots of families that share a three bedroom house with four or five different families. So families in the garage, a families in one room, families in the living room. We even, I've gone to do home visits and a family, a family of four were sleeping in the kitchen. That's their room. Um, so they don't consider themselves homeless. They have a house, so they don't see that as homeless. So when they go to register for school, they don't mark themselves as homeless. But according to the McKinney-Vento laws, they are. They are homeless. And we have hundreds of families that live in three, four, five families in one house. And that is also uh, one of the many factors is poverty. And they don't choose to be homeless. Or lack of housing. Lack of housing and um, what we've observed is like the rent is skyrocketed, the uh, one one um, bedroom apartments. That's nine hundred. A lot of these uh, working families are uh, working class families that work in the field and construction, and most of them suffer from emotional, sexual, mental health problems and um, economic issues. So we want to make sure that we do provide uh, a lot for our community. And if we really are trying to help serve our community, then this is um, the opportunity to have most of you guys, um, you know, re like uh, go back to the Mas Maslow's hierarchy of laws and just look at that. Basic Cause, needs. Yeah, the basic needs, you know, just put yourselves in their shoes. Well, really what we're here, though, is to ask you to partner with Santa Barbara County yes. for that funding so that a non uh, our nonprofit and other nonprofits that work with this, this um, homelessness crisis can apply for these funds to help with students or families that are in this situation. And most of them don't have breakfast either, so we want to make sure they're, they're Thank you very much for being here this evening. Yeah. Do you have a question, Mr. I, I just need to add on to that, though. I mean, this 
uh, these families that are living in cars with children and that sort of thing, that has to stop. They either need to be in our shelter system or uh, they need to be reported to Child Protective Services. Right. Because that and is not healthy, that's not safe. Right, and they have been. And um, the situation is that they're getting removed from the shelter because of uh, behavioral issues. Okay. Then the special probably, education, and, yeah. And we probably need right. to and then, and Child we've, Protective we've Services. Right, and we've made the reports. And eviction right. notices, oh. most of them have eviction, eviction notices that come to us. And we even have veterans that come to Fighting Back asking for help for housing. Thank you very much, ladies. Kirsten Cahoon. Good evening. My name is Kirsten Cahoon and I am the Director of Homeless Services for Good Samaritan Shelter. I am here tonight to urge you to adopt the resolution presented tonight to declare a shelter crisis in Santa Maria. I have worked with the homeless in our community for the past six years and have seen the ever-changing and unfortunately growing face of homelessness in our community. We have continued to see an increase in the number of homeless neighbors in Santa Maria. As you know, Good Samaritan Shelter is the only emergency homeless shelter in Santa Maria and the largest in the county. Tonight as I stand before you, over 180 homeless people are calling our shelter at 401 West Morrison home. Of these 150 clients, over 80 of them are children. Children that did not choose to be in this situation and that are counting on all of us to help them. 18 of these are veterans that served our country. We're at capacity at our shelter and we're turning away single men on a nightly basis. Every day, new families are showing up at our doors, which means we are displacing single men that, we, that are less priority due to the, their ability to survive on the streets. If this does not point to a homeless crisis, I don't know what does. We need to declare this crisis in order to bring new resources to our city to combat this growing problem. We need these resources to help our current clients find housing in order to free up beds for clients on, our, on the streets that are asking for help. So thank you for considering this resolution and continuing to support the efforts to find solutions to homelessness in Santa Maria. Thank you, Ms. Cahoon. Any questions? Okay. Okay. So we have a resolution. Do I have a, hear a motion? I did make the motion, Mayor. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, before I make the motion, I want to make a point of clarification. And Dr. Motes brought up the question. The two young ladies that had to leave, they mentioned that some of these homeless people that are categorized as homeless do have a roof over their heads. But they are still considered homeless because they're living in garages. <clears throat> they're living in less than... Um, physically and mentally healthy conditions in order for them to to uh, to gr grow grow in a proper manner so so it's a little bit confusing in the sense if you have the perspective that a homeless person is somebody who's living under a tree that is true also but they can be classified as homeless even though they're living in some some house with somebody so so it's it's a little misleading the numbers are staggering when you ask that question <clears throat> and, and and it is true they are staggering, but um, we need to get them to better living conditions. So, based on that, I make a motion that we uh, adopt a resolution declaring a shelter crisis in the city of Santa Maria and approve the city's efforts to partner with the county of Santa Barbara applying for the homeless emergency aid uh, program grant. Second. Okay. And the motion has been moved and second to declare the existence of a shelter crisis in the city of San Maria. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Councilmember Boyson? Aye. Councilmember Maltz? Aye. Councilmember Waterfield? And Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. So we'll go on now to, and th thank you very much, all of you, for being here tonight. And we'll go on to uh, regular business and the, uh, it'd be 6A. Or maybe 6B now. Just one moment. Eddie? Mr. Taylor? The meeting, the 9 o'clock meeting in the morning for um, Home for Good, I will be tardy because I've got an 8 o'clock. Okay. 
I will. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The City Council will consider approving the proposed community development block grant funding priorities. Okay. The staff report is to be made by <coughs> Community Programs Manager, Ms. Rojo. It says, not as aquí. See? <laughs> it just happened a month ago. <laughs> Good evening again. We come before you tonight to ask that the City Council adopt a resolution approving the upcoming fiscal year 2019-2020 funding priorities for our Community Development Block Grant funding, better known as CDBG. On an annual basis, the Block Grants Advisory Committee reviews the priorities outlined in the City's five-year consolidated plan and decides whether it needs to be modified based on the current needs of the community. The priorities are one of the tools used by the Committee and the City Council in determining what activities and projects should receive funding to maximize the impact the City's CDBG funds have on its residents. As part of the CDBG funding process, staff conducted a Community Needs Workshop on Monday, August 27th. The meeting was designed to obtain information from residents and nonprofit agencies on the unmet needs in the community. There were 18 participants present at the needs workshop. Most provided feedback on the increased need to fund programs and projects that assist youth development, seniors, mental health services, affordable housing, and more resources for the homeless. However, after hearing from all those participants, no new needs were brought up that are not already covered under the existing CDBG funding priorities. As a result, based on the community participation and HUD recommendations, the Block Grants Advisory Committee recommends that no changes be made to the funding priorities for the upcoming 2019-2020 fiscal year. One potential alternative, which has been recently mentioned, is to uh, move up or reprioritize at-risk youth and youth development. Currently, at-risk youth is a priority 1C and youth development is a priority 2. A higher prioritization may be justifiable given the city's overall priorities and funding allocation. This concludes my presentation. I am happy to answer any questions at this time. Any questions? The, Mr. Boyson? The CBG committee unanimously uh, um, requested that we keep the um, priorities as is? Yes. Is that right? Thank you. Any questions? Um, I attended the meeting, and um, I think there was one person that was there from the community. The rest of the people were from agencies. And that doesn't make their uh, what they said any less relevant, because I think it's really important to know what the agencies do, and, they out, and they're out there, and they do see the unmet needs. Um, but I would like, to, with everything we've been discussing tonight, especially with homelessness, I would like to move out of the, not prevent homelessness, take that out so that we are dealing, I, I think it cleans up that we're dealing with all the homelessness and the money we get from homelessness. That's not to say that when uh, different agencies deal with kids, because they're, they're going to be dealing with homeless kids too. And that they, and I'm not saying that they can't deal with it. I'm just saying let's take that criteria out so that it's all, it's cleaner, it seems to me, to put it over with the home for good and with the money that we're getting through the county on, on, the, on this resolution we just passed. And the HEAP plan, too. The HEAP, yeah. So, so all the HEAP and the home for good and everything we're doing there is all together. And so I, I think it, we wouldn't have any duplication there. And I think it's a cleaner way to do it. And then CDBG that we get would be for critical emergency, at-risk youth, and special population needs. And, and so, okay, so prevent homelessness would also be the... Yeah, but, and that would be all shifted over to the other... So you're saying we would take prevent homelessness out of our community development block grant Out of block grants, uh, priorities? yeah. yeah. I, I think we'd have a problem with HUD with that one. We're, we're still going to be doing. We're still going to be doing that with our youth because we have a lot of homeless youth. I, I think we've got to keep homelessness in there, and I, I think, yeah, I, I mean, okay. 
because when I, you know, and I asked, I asked the CDBG grant committee, because they did pass it unanimously, I said, how much money does the city of Santa Maria now spend on homelessness? And they, they had no idea what we did, I, I, what we do. Oh, the anyway. city, or uh, I can tell you how much CDBG is spent. No, oh, okay. But I asked the committee, and they had no idea mm -hmm. what we were spending right. on that. And it's not that we're not going to continue spending it. I just don't want to see, I want to see it, that it's efficient and that we're not duplicating efforts. Because we'd be over here doing something with CDBG that could be very well done or is being done on Home for Good or with HEAP. So you want to put it under one category? Yeah, I'd like to put all the, yeah. And, and I think that's a good question. Is that going to cause a problem? Well, it should be noted that the, these recommendations, these priorities are based on the city's established local criteria for uh, allocation of CDBG funds. It takes into consideration the federal guidelines for eligibility imposed by HUD. The city, as an entity entitlement community, must fund projects and programs that meet one of three national objectives. So there are three national objectives, the first one being benefit to low and moderate income, the second one is aid in the prevention of elimination of slums and blight, and assist with major uh, catastrophe or emergency. For the most part, the majority, if not all of our money, all of our CDBG money, goes to the benefit of the low and moderate income persons. Mm -hmm. Under HUD, at least 70% of all CDBG programs and, and all CDBG funds must be spent on one of those three national objectives, so benefit to low and moderate income. And, that, and that's fine. I, I think we can do that with those so objectives. So as long as that's met, and, and put the home, the, take the what I'm saying to prevent homelessness, because that we're going to be working on that over here on HEAP and on um, Home for Good. So would your recommendation... And that's my only one, is, is to take that out of, out of CDBG funds. To, so to remove the verbiage, prevent homelessness, and remove that, and just keep number one as address critical emergency, at-risk youth, and special population needs, and yes. keep A, B, and C the same? Yes. We're still going to be low-income, people in poverty, and, but just because they're in well, poverty does not mean they're homeless. But why are we why are we changing the wording? I mean, we're still going to have in there assist persons, particularly working families living in poverty in need of food, shelter, clothing, health care, blah blah blah. Um, I mean, I, I have, I, I mean, on several different levels. I mean, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that homelessness is is one of the biggest blights that we can have on our city and that well, we they're not talking about well okay need to continue okay. excuse me if I can and the second thing is if if we're going to do anything I mean we're going to have to vet this back through the CDBG committee I mean we've all as a, a council been chastised for trying to change priorities of the CDBG committee and they work very hard at these things and I I would I would certainly, if, if that's a suggestion, my suggestion would be then to kick that back to the CDBG committee for, for proper vetting. I, I don't have a problem with that. The, 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 the point I'm making is when I was at the CDBG grants committee, I asked them how much do we spend on homeless. But besides what we spend on homeless, what do we spend in police on homeless and other code compliance. No, that's correct. We, we, and we also have the transitional homeless grant that we've received the $2 million for the two years here. Um, and yeah, you're correct. There are indirect costs that we spend that are probably eight times what we spend directly to Home for Good um, with the rangers, the police, um, public works and utilities cleaning out camp encampments and code enforcement. I, I'm not suggesting that we do anything less for the homeless. I'm saying put it all into one area. This frees up some of the money. It's not going to free up. It's going to free up some of the money to be spent on at-risk youth and special population and, and needs. I, I think we already have that. I, and when we're talking about the heap money, and we're also talking about uh, this two million dollar grant that we received from the state, those are one-time funds. We don't know that those are coming back next year. I, 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 okay, and then and then. <laughs> We could go back to this if that doesn't work the following year. I just think, I think we're going to see duplication of effort, and I don't think it's going to be as efficient with the other. Uh, I, I don't, I don't agree with that. Anyway, I don't agree with that at all. I may here. Yes. Um, I, I would be hesitant to remove it 
without doing a little bit more homework and checking, unless you've done it already or unless uh, Mr. Trujillo or Rosie can answer this question. <clears throat> I see this, two things could happen. If we, if we, if we bifurcated the homeless issue from the, from the current CDBG issue, and that would tend to um, uh, appear as though or actually uh, rise, the, or elevate the level of, and the importance of, of homelessness. We're giving them their own title, so to speak. However, what does that do when, when they evaluate and the feds look at the issue and decide, well, you don't have homeless in here. It must have solved the problem. So. Uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to look at the, the contribution a little bit differently. So I think we should talk to somebody uh, before we make such a change uh, and find out if that is going to be influenced. Unless you can answer that or Gil can answer that right now. I can answer that. Homelessness is something that we have to report on, uh, both in our action plan and in our caper. What we're going to do in our action plan and what we did do in our caper. Okay, then when you read that criteria that you just gave us, it says low, moderate income. Does it say homeless in the criteria? No. Homeless fall under low and moderate. Yeah, and I understand that. So by taking this out, isn't it, it's not any different than the criteria she just read to us. And, and, and I don't want to lose sight of the fact that when... Uh, and and I can say this now because because I have uh, separated my employment from Good Samaritan Shelter. When Good Samaritan Shelter or the Rescue Mission or whoever comes in and uh, is looking for a new roof or is looking for a, uh, a new flooring or whatever, geez, you know we've taken homelessness out of that out of that definition, and and they're not going to be eligible for okay. CDG. Okay, I, I, uh, then I then I need to clarify that because I I wouldn't want it on any of the capitals at all for homeless because I think that. That's fine the way it is. I'm just saying when we give monies to uh, different agencies that do work within the city of Santa Maria, um, and fi Fighting Back, of course, it comes first to me, but um, I know Fighting Back partners with the Good Samaritan Shelter on, on different activities that they have and mental health things. That's not a problem. That's not a problem because they are still low, moderate income. What I'm saying is, I guess I'm not saying this very clear. But I would just the reason I'd like to take it out is to put it into one box where we deal with all the homeless in the heap and with our our home for good and any other grants that we get. It's all dealt with together so that we're not falling over one one another and we're not um, duplicating efforts. I just think it'd be much more efficient. And I, we do get I, I we do get we do is, get but. areas that we're we're not able to fund on CDBG. I, I'm not saying it's like it's just sort of moving it over to another spot where it's going to get funded rather than CDBG. I'd like to know what uh, Mr. Stillwell and Mr. Trujillo think in regards to to what the mayor is addressing. No, I think either Madam Mayor and members of the council, either option is feasible. It's a policy call. Um, the if it would be compliant with our if it would be compliant with HUD if the council does eliminate the words prevent homelessness and and if the council reprioritizes number one to address critical emergency at risk youth and special population needs. Um, so I mean it's a it's a policy choice for the council and I um, we do have a number of homeless uh, or a number of costs that are working to address homelessness that we could better categorize as one cost center and then also I think the point is that uh, the point I heard made was we do over these next couple of years have one-time funding to help bridge the gap and then in the future if the council wants to reprioritize homelessness as those other fundings go away that'll be a policy decision at that point as well yes dr. Motes yeah. Well, after what I've heard this evening, some of which is shocking to me, I'm in favor of keeping preventing homelessness in the priorities for the community development block grants. Okay, that's fine. I just I just thought it'd be cleaner if we just put all the homelessness into one box and dealt with it that way. That's fine. Okay. 
So then, um, Madam Mayor, then we would be looking for the council to provide or to adopt a resolution uh, approving the, the uh, priorities for the what, the funding priorities for CDBG, whether they're as recommended by the Block Grant Advisory okay. Committee. Okay, do I have a motion? I, I think we probably need to ask for. Oh, I'm sorry. Do any you quite request to speak? We do not. We do not. Okay, thank you. Uh, with any, that, any, would... any written communications? No. No. Okay, Mr. Boyson. With that, I would uh, move for a resolution City Council, City of Santa Maria, approving the Community Development Block Grant priorities for fiscal year 1920 funding process. No, I'll second that. Uh, it's been moved and second to approve the. 2019-20 uh, proposed priorities for CDBG funding. Councilmember Poison. Aye. Councilmember Motes. Aye. Councilmember Cordero. Aye. Councilmember Waterfield. Aye. And Mayor Patino. Aye. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on now to where do we go here? Uh, report by the City Manager, Mr. Stillwell. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. The next meeting of the City Council is October 2nd. We have two presentations scheduled for that meeting. One, we had spent the summer doing a pavement management <coughs> survey. We want to return to the council to apprise you of the status of the city's roads and streets. And so we'll present um, the findings from the pavement management plan. And then also we have the uh, regular uh, presentation from the Chamber of Commerce, the Economic Development Commission, and the Visitors Bureau, and the update of their efforts and activities over the last six months and that concludes my report thank you the next item is oral reports of council members and mr boyson uh thank you madam mayor i have no uh, required reporting but we did receive uh some news uh the state of california department of water resources has sent a letter to the county of santa barbara advising them that they would accept Central Coast Water Authority in place of the County of Santa Barbara as the primary obligor under the uh, state water contract, which is great news. The next step would be for us to um, present this to the uh, County Board of Supervisors, hopefully sooner rather than later, for a formal vote of them to authorize the uh, uh, delegation of that contract over to Central Coast Water Authority. As we've mentioned many times in the past, this uh, will provide us with uh, significantly more flexibility in when we manage our water, uh, certain things that we won't have to go through the County of Santa Barbara that uh, will be done through the Central Coast Water Authority um, would be much more efficient. Uh, in this regard, as we go forward, we are going to ask all of the council to uh, uh, reach out to any of the supervisors uh, of the county of Santa Barbara, any of the supervisors, and um, request that they vote uh, favorably for the um, allocation or for the uh, uh, designation of the contract over to Central Coast Water Authority. Certainly, uh, any um, in, any uh, uh, council on and any individuals on the council that have uh, a relationship with Supervisor Adam, Supervisor Hartman specifically, and uh, incoming Supervisor Hart. Uh, would be greatly appreciated and of course uh, Supervisor oh. Williams uh, uh, from the first district, but uh, it, it was great news finally getting that formal letter from Department of Water Resources it kept going back and forth Everybody, They said well, we want you to request it and no we need you to del you know Tell us that it'll happen if we do request it and things like that. So um, This was a, a giant step forward and uh, we're looking forward to in the next 90 days of um, Perhaps uh, seeing this come to fruition. Do you think it's going to be a hard sell to the County Board of Supervisors? It, there are going to be individuals on the County Board of Supervisors who will look at this as a um, loss of control mm -hmm. and perhaps uh, uh, one more item that they won't be able to use for their um, limitations on growth. Uh, I, I can see that yeah. as being an argument. But uh, hopefully calmer minds will prevail. I, I certainly think that there's at least 
three supervisors that this is a win-win situation that uh, you know it'll provide more water for the San Inez Valley for Guadalupe certainly for the Santa Maria Valley um, and uh, and and even South County for uh, their availability of water so I I, I hope hope this is going to be a slam dunk but uh, we don't want to go in there without knowing that we've got all the votes uh, absolutely and you yeah. believe that turning it over to the Central Coast Water Authority they would be more pragma pragmatic when it comes to our issues and what we need and exactly okay. exactly right interesting thank mm. you yeah so uh, again uh, we will be uh, uh, getting in touch with each and every one of you as we as we go mm -hmm. forward on this to um, get in front of those uh, various supervisors that uh, where we need the support be happy to do so mm -hmm. Ms. Waterfield yes madam mayor on uh, Wednesday September 5th uh, I attended along with you the tour of hope refuge um, in regards to uh, traffic trafficked uh, sexual vic victims and it's going to be a refuge that is absolutely going to be wonderful for these uh, young ladies it's only going to be for uh, girls now from the ages of 12 to 18 years old beautiful place it, the atmosphere is going to be absolutely wonderful along with a lot of clinical uh, help in regards to um, these young girls uh, later that evening I attended a special reception honoring um, the uh, honoring Ted and Cheryl Maddox uh, they did in um, Africa a photo shoot that uh, Mr. Maddox had done in uh, Tanzania, Africa, and it was just absolutely wonderful, the pictures he captured, and that was just amazing. Later that evening, I attended the 47th Law Enforcement uh, Dinner at the Elks. On September the 6th, um, I attended the LAFCO meeting, which Santa Maria did finally get the connection for our... Um, specific water cooler that was asking for um, help their their water system in the county off a bit off a bit Arabia and correct me if I if I'm wrong mr. Um, Ng, is that uh, it was full of nitrates and it was undrinkable and so we had a we had a water connection going straight across from them so we're finally going to get that taken care of um, I went to the measure you um, Forum to listen more about uh, Measure U in regards to the opposition, the for and the against Measure U. Uh, attended the Business Expo at the Santa Maria Fair Park. Um, I also attended Saturday. Oh, this was fun. Saturday, September 8th was welcome was welcome athletes at the regional special olympics golf tournament and skills competition and this was at the country club and we had a, a great uh, a variety of youth there that that golf and they were just so excited about what they were what they were attending um, monday september 10th i attended meet the candidates at the casa grande mobile estates um, mobile home park and where we had various candidates come in and talk about what they what they would do in regards to the mobile home situation that a lot of these mobile home parks are um, having in regards to landlords versus mobile home owners and that was that was very interesting to do um, on September 11th I attended the uh, September 11th the ceremonies at station number five and uh, there's always a nice little group over there there is a city worker her name escapes me but her children go to st. Mary's and every year she brings her children there and they they know what 9-11 is all about and they were born after 9-11 so it, it's just I just think that she's just a really neat uh, lady then after that uh, left that evening uh, to attend the uh, annual conference um, in Long Beach with uh, with many of my colleagues and September 15th Saturday attended the city employees appreciation barbecue which was really great a lot of great people there that was awesome and then on September 16th I provided the Elk Gritos at the Fiesta Patrias on Sunday uh, the Mexican consulate was there very very nice very nice people and um, <coughs> I believe that was it. Okay, Dr. Motes. Yeah, for a change, I actually have something to report. 
On October 5th, I attended the city meeting with the Airport Board of Directors where we discussed, hopefully at some point in the future, getting a flight out of Santa Maria Airport to someplace <laughs> other than Las Vegas. <laughs> Later on that day in the evening, I also attended the Law Enforcement Awards Dinner at the Elks. On October 6th, I went to the Measure U debate at the Board of Supervisors building. On October 9th, I went to the concert in the park with you two ladies. Oh, that's right. On October 10th, I attended the candidate forum at Casa Grande Mobile Home Park, <coughs> where I learned about tenant-landlord relationships. On October 13th and 14th, I went down with multiple other city members to the California League of Cities convention and learned about the homeless and uh, city financial funding and other interesting political things. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> On September the 5th, I also attended the uh, annual law enforcement dinner at the Elks. And once again, that's a great success for our city and for the Elks. On the 6th, I uh, was at the uh, forum for for the uh, Measure U at the Joe Centeno Building. And um, it, it was enlightening to me that there are some, probably some misunderstandings on Measure U and the the idea that they can, we can just do anything we want with the money. That's what I got the impression from, from some people. And, and that, of course, that's not the case. We all know that. <clears throat> uh, from the 11th to the 14th, I was in Long Beach with everyone else <clears throat> at the League of California Cities. That was also very interesting. It's always enlightening. It, it's nice to see that they bring forth some training that is uh, in, in need today. I remember when I started the police services that some of the training we'd go to in the 70s, they were bring out films then, and they would be driving around in 1950s and 60s cars to train us in the 1970s and 80s, and it just didn't seem to fit. This was very interesting. On the 15th, I was at the San Ramon City Barbecue at the uh, Maldonado Center. And on uh, yesterday, the 17th, I attended the LCAP meeting for the Santa Maria Benita School District. And uh, they're starting to get ready to enjoy another positive year in, uh, in, in uh, changing their delivery system uh, for educating the children. They, they've uh, kind of wrapped a, a, a business plan around it, and they're, they're using a lot of <coughs> data that they extract in order to develop the, the matrix to deliver the, the educational system that they have to deliver. And that would be it for me, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Cordero. <clears throat> September 5th, I um, did a tour of the Hope Refuge uh, that Ms. Waterfield was mentioning that will house 24 girls from the age of 12, uh, 12 through 17, 18, that have been um, trafficked. I attended a special reception at the Ann Foxworthy Gallery honoring Ted and Cheryl Maddox and the photographs they had taken in um, Africa. I attended the 47th Annual Law Enforcement Appreciation Night at the Elks Club that night. And I, I think our Elks Club is one of the few Elks Clubs that does that, because not all of them do that, especially in the larger cities. September 7th, I attended a Fighting Back uh, board meeting and went to downtown Fridays. September 8th, I uh, attended the Measure U. And, and also, I, a lot of people don't realize that there is an oversight committee for Measure U to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing with, with the monies. And September 9th, I, I did the concert in the park. September 10th, I went to meet the candidates ice cream social at Casa Grande Mobile Home Estates. September 11th, I attended the commemoration at Fire Station 1 and then at the library shop, the anniversary and renovation of the Santa Maria Public Library Shop. September 12th to 14th, I attended the League of Cities annual conference. September 14th, uh, the city employee barbecue and 
where Mr. Cordero makes the beans. I don't know what time you get there in the morning, but those beans are excellent. And um, <coughs> September 18th, did the Ben Hayes radio show this morning and met with one of the managers of Walmart. Anything further from the dais? If not, this meeting is adjourned.